Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Cathy for describing those of us talking this morning as leading practitioners. Um, I hope, at least as far as I'm concerned, that opinion isn't revised by all of you once you've had me talk, um, but there we go. So it falls to me today to talk to you about inventive step and patent law, in particular after the case of activists and ICOS. Um, full disclosure, as you probably are all aware, I was in activists and ICOS. And it's the most recent case, particularly from the Supreme Court, that addresses obviousness. So without much further ado, let's have a quick chat about it. So the starting point to activist NICOS is the history. It was to do with a patent for a compound called Tadalafil, which is known as Cialis. Just as an aside, if someone had said to me at the outset of this that I would end up going all the way to Supreme Court slideshow that people will see the slides. Great, thank you. I told you I'm not very good with technology. <laughs> yes, please. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so if someone has said to me at the outset that uh, I would end up going to the Supreme Court to talk about erectile dysfunction, <laughs> I would have had that exact response. But there we go. So, Cialis, Tadalafil, erectile dysfunction. The starting point in all of this is that Tadalafil, which is the underlying compound, was a second in class. So that obviously brings in questions on dosing, dosage regimes, uh, Swiss form claims, and so forth. The reason I flagged these particular bits uh, is important because a lot of what we talk about in IP is technical contribution. And it's fair to say that Cialis has commercially been a very successful drug, and to that extent, one would say that there has been some sort of technical contribution. As I said, it was a second-in-class drug. Uh, Viagra was the first erectile dysfunction drug of this sort. Crucially, Cialis was more selective, and is more selective than Viagra. Just to add a bit of an illustration there, uh, a relatively common side effect of Viagra is blue vision because of its lack of specificity. Cialis doesn't have this problem. A slightly more interesting element is to do with drug accumulation uh, and a possibility of taking a drug daily as opposed to on demand. And finally, as part of the specificity of Cialis, you get reduced side effects. So, as I said, the reason I'm flagging this at the outset is because it's plain at some level, but there is a fairly chunky technical contribution there. So what happened? Uh, first instance, the case came before Mr Justice Burse, uh, who saw that what had really gone on here was some lengthy and extensive research. And the big question really for the court to consider was, is empirical research of this sort from you know, phase one, phase two studies and all the rest, and dosage and dose response curve studies as well in particular, is that ever routine? And the true value of the value judgments that might come along the way. And for your reference, I'm not going to take you all through all the judgments, don't worry, but for those of you who have trouble sleeping at night, feel free to go and read those particular paragraphs of the first instance judgment. Um, and Mr Justice Burst, as I said, found the patent to be valid and infringed. Now, this takes us on really to the crux of the matter, which is how does one assess obviousness? Or rather, to be true to the statute in the Patents Act, inventive step. And this is a statutory question. And as you can all see, this is to do with the invention shall be taken to involve an inventive step if it is not obvious to a person skilled in the art having regard to any matter which forms part of the state of the art. So the first thing, of course, is to say, when do you ask that question? Do you ask it standing at that point, at the priority date, which is, to a certain degree, what Mr Justice Burr started doing, or at what stage is it permissible to take in some events downstream from that if those events truly could be said to be routine, or perhaps even inevitable? So it really is all about inventive steps, is my attempt at drawing an inventive step there. <laughs> and uh, again, the thing to bear in mind at the outset is that if you go through a thorough examination of the case law, inventive step does seem to be a truly multifactorial assessment. Uh, 
And the question is, how do you resolve those two things? You have a single inventive step idea on the one hand, and something that necessarily involves adding a bit more flavour with a multifactorial assessment. So the losing, party, uh, losing parties appealed to the Court of Appeal. And interestingly, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, because obviousness, first and foremost, is quite often a fact-finding and fact-dependent assessment, the appeal was allowed, and the patent was found to be invalid for lack of inventive step. And this is where the first instance court and the Court of Appeal diverged, in that the Court of Appeal found that in certain circumstances, and that's a key point, there is, in fact, nothing inventive about routine steps, even if the actual specific outcome itself cannot be predicted. It's enough to know that you will end up at that sort of outcome, and I'll come to that point. And this is just quite a useful summary in the Court of Appeal judgment. This is a bit from Lord Justice Floyd's uh, section of the judgment, uh, and... This is simply the point we were discussing, which is that there are some steps which can be characterised as so routine that the skilled person would carry them out simply because they are routine, irrespective of any prospect of success. And the example, of course, is the routine dose ranging studies and clinical testing of a known drug. Also, for your note as well, C152, where Lord Justice Kitchen has a similar thing. So this takes us to... A case that's now a few years old, activists and Merck. Some of you might know it as the finasteride case. And this really is where, in particular for dosing regime patents, the story really starts. And the point here is, in fact, the sort of presumption, and I can tell you for nothing that the other side who was seeking to revoke the patent relied on this pretty heavily, uh, to say that the presumption effectively is that nearly all dosage regime patents will be obvious, simply because, as a matter of research it is standard practice to investigate appropriate dosage regime. And of course it is. For a regulatory point of view, you have to find the, the uh, dose of the drug that is effective, that is safe, and typically you don't want to give more of a certain drug than you have to to a patient. And what uh, Lord Joseph Jacob did in this case, he pointed out that it's only really in an unusual case, such as that particular case, where simply specifying a dosing regime and seeking patent protection on it is something that can confer validity on an otherwise invalid claim. And then also, just taking you back, well, now with that in mind, to the Court of Appeal decision. Uh, again, there's this point that although the skill team would be surprised by this result, and the sort of, to put it in a, a broad sense, sort of the lack of predictability of that exact result, namely the efficacy of a 5 meg per day uh, drug, the point being that it was a standard and routine thing to do would be to investigate the dose response, which in fact is required by clinical research in phase 2b clinical trials. So it's one of those where you know the endpoint is there, you know the steps you can take to reach the endpoint. The fact that the number is 5 as opposed to, say, 10, which is a, the element that's going to surprise you, doesn't in fact make those routine steps that you're taking along the way inventive. And that was quite an important development. Just to add a bit more context, the reason why the 5 mg a day is important is because uh, Mr. Justice Burse, at first instance, in fact found that a 25 mg dose would be an obvious thing to do, because at your starting point, you take your higher doses. And his point, he was seeking to draw some contrast between the fact that at an earlier stage in your investigations into dose response and into suitable dosages, you would very quickly, in the first round of studies, alight on a higher dose, but you wouldn't necessarily have a lower dose in mind. And that element of surprise and the judgment of stepping forward was the thing that, for him, distinguished an obvious and an inventive outcome, which, of course, the Court of Appeal disagreed with. So what happened next? As the losing party, we at Lily Icos decided to appeal to the Supreme Court because, as I said, in the context of patent law as a whole, it's pretty unusual to have an obvious decision overturned. In the meantime, there was this issue about the generics launching onto the market and trying to preserve the position. And it's quite an unusual, interesting point here, because what was happening in the background was that the, there was an SPC on the basic patent that was due to expire. So we were desperate to hold the ring, so to speak, until after the outcome of our permission to appeal to the Supreme Court application. <coughs> 
So we applied for a preliminary injunction, and this was heard by Mr Justice Henry Carr. And again, he had the benefit of both the first instance and the Court of Appeal decisions at that point. And he took the similar view to this, the Court of Appeal, and again, qualified this slightly to put in the word entirely routine, which I think was an important addition there, that it's that routineness in general does not equal a presumption of invalidity. But when you have a more special circumstance, where you have something that is so routine, it can be said to be entirely routine, that the presumption of validity starts to slip away. And this is really what he was saying here. Um, and further, exactly as, uh, as is in the quote, that not only was this an entirely routine step, on the judge's own findings, it was one that was a very likely step for the skill team to take. And he just there references back to the bit of uh, Lord Justice Floyd's uh, judgment that we just saw. So accordingly, Mr Justice Henry Carr decided that there was no realistic prospect that the appeal would succeed, and as you can see, his ju the judgment was an application simply by the Court of Appeal as to the facts as found to existing and settled principles of law. Now, what I could say at this stage is, frankly, this would have saved people like me a lot of time and effort <laughs> if uh, the Supreme Court had taken a similar view, but there we go. Surprisingly, so it's against that, the Supreme Court decided to grant permission. So what happened? The Supreme Court really spent a lot of time considering that statutory question, namely all about inventive step and how to assess inventive step. And during the course of discussion and debate, we had a lot of discussion about putting glosses on the text of that statutory question. Because, as I said, it's quite difficult to take something in the abstract, namely how to assess inventive step, with the facts of a particular case. And both parties referred to the, as I'm sure you're all very familiar with, the Pozzoli approach and the EPO problem solution approach. And the Supreme Court listened to all of this and said what they wanted to sort of guard against was adding too much gloss onto that text of that inventive step question and generally put a general warning about perhaps applying such glosses in an overly sort of mechanistic way. That's paragraph 62 of the Supreme Court decision. Despite that, the Supreme Court then went on to provide a lengthy list of factors which are relevant considerations. And notably, the reason that I have included this particular extract is in the present case. And that's an important thing for you all to bear in mind, uh, particularly because of the idea about the general applicability of the Supreme Court decision in this case. So, just to trot through them very quickly, one, well, obvious to try. That, of course, brings in an element of expectation of success. Two, how routine is the relevant research? And we've talked about this, and that's where you have a bit of a tension between empirical research, routineness, predictability, and patent protection. Three, for the first time, uh, burden and cost of research featured on this list. Four, value judgments. This is perhaps harking back to Mr Justice Bursa first instance about the perhaps that as part of empirical research, one has to not lose sight of the fact that there will be, or can be in certain circumstances, value judgments along the way. Five, alternative multiple paths of research. Necessarily, if there's a fork in the road, you might like to think it was a less obvious fork to take. Six, motive. Obviously, something that a lot of people are going to be discussing today. Seven, Unexpected and surprising results, and this comes back to the slight tension between the first instance decision and the Court of Appeal decision on the impact and importance of surprise when you're carrying out routine studies. Eight, the thing that we all try and guard against as IP practitioners, hindsight. And nine, bonus effect. However, more interestingly perhaps for today, was the tenth factor that Lord Hodge, who wrote the judgment from the Supreme Court, and this is something he flagged at paragraph 74. And this is, again, back to this cautioning against, perhaps, a, a general principle being set down by the Supreme Court in this case, which is where he flagged the fact that the courts have to have regard to all the relevant facts of a particular case in assessing whether an alleged invention is obvious. One of those facts is the nature of the invention. A tenth consideration, therefore, is that we are concerned with a dosage patent with a Swiss form claim and an EPC 2000 claim. 
the possibility that a dosage pattern with such claims that may be valid has been recognised. So here you have the Supreme Court saying, in case you're all worried, we do endorse and indeed positively recognise that as a starting point, a dosage patent can be valid. Although you might ask, given this judgment, precisely what circumstances do you need to find yourself in in order to have such a thing? So this then takes us on really to the next nub of it. In this particular case, could it be said that uh, there was a bit of a missed opportunity to perhaps give inventive step law a bit of a shake-up? Or in fact, was the Supreme Court doing a very prudent and sensible thing here, which was recognising on the facts of this case that they needn't go too far and perhaps ought not to go too far? So perhaps it falls for a different case where the question of obviousness arises to go to the Supreme Court to have the idea of inventive step looked at again. And indeed, at paragraph 63, Lord Hodge really explained why this case in particular was seen as so controversial and why there was so much interest in it, which is the, the headline points that we have been through in the Court of Appeals judgment, which is that when reading the Court of Appeals judgment, the routineness and the importance that they place on the routineness of everything really jumps out. And I think for people both as practitioners, uh, academics, and also clients and pharmaceutical companies, were quite concerned that the Court of Appeal seemed to effectively be saying, at a certain level, routineness equals invalidity. Because, of course, in today's day and age, with empirical research, routine is necessarily part of the picture. So, where does that take us? Well, it takes us back to activists and Merck. And the Supreme Court went back to that quote of Lord Justice Jacob and started talking about the fact that, first, it is generally standard practice to investigate appropriate dosage regimes. The skilled team, in this case, but also more broadly, is generally familiar with multiple dose-ranging studies. So, therefore, the inventiveness of, and this is why I've included any, dosage regime falls to be assessed in that context. On the facts of the case, the notional skilled person's task is to find the appropriate dosage regime, and those procedures are familiar and routine. So again, it comes back to the point of, really, what does one have to do in order to come up with an inventive dosage regime? And the Supreme Court continued to note that, in fact, there was no mystery to this qualification regarding dosage regimes, because the skilled person's target is, in large measure, predetermined. But again, the tension there is with empirical research and with studies that you, one needs to go through in order to gain approval for a particular drug, that process is itself, in a large measure, predetermined. And it's something I don't think the Supreme Court grappled with as much as perhaps we would have liked them to have done. But again, it comes back to the context is key, and that on the facts of this case, by going through those predetermined steps, the skilled team arrives at that invention. So where does that take us? Has the threshold for inventive step moved, or is it business as usual? Now, as you can imagine, there are a number of interveners that put submissions in as part of the Supreme Court proceedings, and this here at 103 was really where the Supreme Court was responding to those concerns. And particularly, as I mentioned a moment ago, this concern of the idea that by carrying out routine or well-established inquiries, the outcome just simply cannot be inventive. And crucially, you can see here that just the avoidance of doubt, Lord Hodge was at pains to point out that that's not the case. And that secondly, in the second bullet point uh, there, under the paragraph 103 reference, that there is no policy reason why a novel inventive dosage regime should not be rewarded by patent. Now, for those of you who have my slides in front of you, you'll notice a typo in that one, where I actually omitted to include the word not <laughs> in that. <laughs> Some might say that's quite interesting. Um, and then finally, this is the point about rewarding research if it meets the statutory tests. So, this is, comes back perhaps to the patent bargain, namely the inventor attains a monopoly in return for disclosing the invention and then dedicating it to the public for use after the monopoly has expired. But to do that, there has to be an invention. And this is where Lord Hodge really sort of drilled down into this particular case 
and talked about the balance and symmetry in patent law, and that where there is a pre-established or at least foreseeable target, and this is the first time we have a sort of foreseeable element coming in here, into validity, of the skill team's test holds the key to the resolution. So what he was really saying here is that, going back to Mr Justice Henry Carr, when something is entirely routine, and that process is so established that whilst the actual specifics of the target might not be known, the fact that the target exists and that that's the thing you're aiming for is enough for the purposes of defeating some kind of attempt at seeking patent protection. And this is where I think it's a bit interesting, because, of course, when we talk about a patent monopoly, we talk about that patent monopoly needing to be justified by the actual technical contribution to the art. And this, of course, has not just been considered in the ICOS case, but also in the Warner-Lambert Supreme Court case. But where does that leave us in a case like this, where, as I said at the outset, there was a clear technical contribution. This is a drug that can now be taken daily. Uh, it provides far fewer side effects. It's a far more specific drug. From a commercial point of view, which, of course, is not the test for obviousness, it's been a very successful product. So at what stage on the path does technical contribution be divorced from true innovation. And this is something I think that is perhaps for another day. The next thing to consider perhaps is that does activists and ICOS present issues for any classes of medical innovation? And I think a lot of you are getting where I'm coming from with this in particular to do with dosing regime patterns. Now the interesting thing in this case is that Lord Hodge made a reference to the EPO's approach to all of this. And that, for your note, if you want to do is paragraph 75 of this judgment, where he expressly flagged that the EPO has not sanctioned any relaxation in terms of the approach of obviousness and the consideration of obviousness for dosage patents. But where does that leave us? By expressly not sanctioning any relaxation, does that necessarily mean that if the threshold, which is what the Supreme Court was at pains to say, is the same for everything, which, of course, is one would argue, the right way of doing it, does that mean in practice it's going to be fiendishly difficult for a dosing patent and a dosage patent to be valid unless, going back to activists and Merck, there is something truly unusual about it? And then, unfortunately, that's just going to come down to a matter of fact and degree and assessment. So as I've said here, in my view, the Supreme Court judgment does appear to be at pains to avoid developing any new principle of general applicability beyond saying that dosage patterns are not a special case. Crucially, they note that the Pozzoli approach and the Lumbeck factors remain relevant. And the way that I think of it, which is what I've alluded to here, with more R, less D, is to me it means more research and less development, at least in the law of obviousness. To me, I don't feel that this has developed the law of obviousness. It's simply provided a little bit more research. And then, I think I've run slightly short, so apologies, or you might be relieved. Um, what does this, where does this leave us? So the Supreme Court decision was now, was handed down back end of 2019. We've now had a full year um, Oh, sorry, no, it wasn't. It was only the beginning of 2019. It was hardly the end of 2018. We've now had a full year of cases going through the patent courts. And speaking for myself, having been in a few of them, it really does feel like business as usual. The activists and ICOS factors that we went through have been referenced by some judges, but certainly the Pozzoli approach is still valid. The Lumbeck factors are still considered. And I think importantly as well, there's not a suggestion that those 9 slash 10 factors identified by Lord Hodge are A, something that has to be considered in every case, and B, crucially, all of them have to be considered in every case. Really, that takes us back to the position we were in the first place, which is that inventive step is truly a multifactorial assessment, and it all really depends on the facts and the circumstances of a particular case. And then uh, Mr Justice Arnold, as he then was, said, I thought I'd leave you with this quote from him, which seems, I think, to echo those views, which is that the overall tenor of the judgment in this Supreme Court case is to confirm the approach which had previously been adopted by the courts to this question. And I think that's probably a, a fair and succinct summary at the moment. So I think what it really falls to is the future and to see whether any of the judges start to develop and apply those factors, which do add a little bit of gloss in the cases going forward and perhaps 
if another obviousness case goes to the Supreme Court, hopefully sooner rather than later, so that the question truly of how does one assess inventive step and where does it sit in terms of IP innovation, that really still needs to be considered. Thank you.